increasingly small. And then we talked about partitioning. Uh, partitioning is really an important um, aspect. And here it's about separating a data set into groups. And you have a couple of design choices here. How do you divide the data up between views? For example, give them a hierarchy of attributes. How many splits do you make? What is the order of the splits? How many views do you have? Um, and this is like usually data driven. And what you typically use is categorical attributes. So like one good example would be if you want to visualize like revenue in, within the United States, you could split it up uh, into four different areas. You could have the um, North e or the East, the Midwest, the Mountain West, and the West Coast. And this would be like our, your, our categorical partitioning variable. So splitting it up and then showing this um, according to those regions. Uh, these were, this was an example of the trellis plots, which splits it up in a couple of ways. So here we have a trellis plot that splits it up for years between those two, and then by farms uh, along here. Here we have a layering, which is kind of like my next slide. Here we are only um, partitioning by the farms, uh, but layering the years. So here the pink ones are 1932, and the blue ones are 1931. So this, these two charts show the same data. In this case, we have made a decision to partition by year. In this case, we have made a decision to layer by year. Um, and then I showed you this example of this intricate visualization um, where we can recursively partition attributes by a variety of elements. Um, I don't want to go into the details of this now. Um, and then layering, I already mentioned it. This is about combining multiple views on top of one another to form a composite view. Um, and the idea is here that we can um, support a larger, more detailed view than using multiple views. Um, of course, we have to pick visual encodings where that works. So we have to, like, for, it works well for things like line chart, where I have multiple um, items that have the same dimensions and that play, over the sa play out over the same time, for example. Uh, but it, it, there are some constraints um, about what I can do with layering. And so the simplest example is this layering of multiple um, lines in a chart. Um, and yeah, this is kind of like the, the gist of multiple coordinate views. So how are we doing on the video? Uh, we are recording on this, uh, but we don't know when the memory card will get full. So Okay. Just so. so we'll just play it by ear. Great. So uh, now we'll be talking about tables. But first, a couple of organizational points. Um, there will be a homework lab tomorrow at 6 PM in L110. Is the room number right? Yeah. Um, and the homework lab is in so far important because we will be using a concept in the homework that we haven't really talked about, there's this linking and brushing. Like we have talked about it in concept, but we haven't talked about how you can implement that in D3. And so Carolina will also introduce linking and brushing in the homework lab. Um, so it's kind of important if you don't know about this and if you prefer to uh, hear about it and read, uh, rather than read the documentation that you go to the homework lab. And then it's also time to think about your projects. Many of you have already approached me about project ideas and so on. Uh, but this week, at the end of this week, you have to announce your team. Uh, you have to essentially give us your title, so you have to have a direction. And you have to um, provide us with a link to your GitHub repository. And remember that your GitHub repository can be public, so it can be private. And if you want to make it private for some reason, just talk to me. Um, but ideally, it should be public. Um, and if you can't find a teammate, um, if you don't have something set up or have no idea of what to do yet, please get in touch. Um, I'm kind of like brokering connections between people. If, if that doesn't work out for you yourself um, on the Slack channel, you can send me an email, hey, that's my name, I have a project idea or I don't have a project idea, and then I'll connect you to other people who are still in look for a teammate. Um, and as I said, please make sure to submit this information by Friday. Any questions about the project? Yeah. No, that's a Google form, um, and it's um, and that there's a link on the project page of the website. Um, so essentially, like what we we use this Google form to like have access to your project and look at it. And then after after you like next Friday afterwards um, is your project proposal due. So you should also be working on that already. There's a couple of examples also on the website. Um, and um, yeah, for your project proposal, just make sure 
uh, that everything is in place and that you've thought about the data, that you're able to get the data. As I mentioned before, the most important aspect of your project is to be able to actually have usable data. That you should, like, it's, it's, I kind of expect that some of you might have to do some data managing, but it shouldn't be the majority of the project, right? You shouldn't, like, do some kind of um, NLP on your data set first before you actually do visualization. Okay. So today we'll be talking about tables. This is the figure that we um, used when we talked about um, the different types of data. And so we'll be talking about uh, different types of data, um, like multidimensional tables and uh, tables where we have heterogeneous um, attributes in them. Uh, we talked about items and attributes and so on. So this is just a context. And so I kind of want to start this off with kind of challenging your creativity. Um, like, I'll give you 10 minutes to sketch two ways for each of those tables to visualize those tables. And you will notice that those tables are different. Here we have, it's the same people on this table, so our independent variables here are people and we have observations about those people. In the one case we have age, their best time at 100 meter rates, their, faster, uh, their furthest jump, in, uh, and their uh, sex. And in the other one we have a time series of beats per minute of heart rate. Um, and you should create like two visualizations for each of those tables. Um, and then we'll talk about your choices and we'll like formally talk about those choices in the rest of the class. And if you need any paper, uh, I have scratch paper, but other than that, um, you can just look at, for, for the data, you can just look at the slide. Uh, you can do it in a group. Thank you. 
two, T3, T3. And then I'm not going to draw the details here, but it's something like this. Yes. Um, generally, we see kind of like a trend here. Okay, another idea for this. A bar chart. A group bar chart. Um, so, yep. Something like this. Any other ideas? Just like plots, and I have here like any, and then I have basal. And how would you show the time points here? Like what happens if I have, how do I know that which time point is which? It's possible, right? We could use color for that. Uh, but it's maybe a little bit trickier. Like if we if we did that, we could also like highlight time point one, time point two, and time point three like this, and then show relationships between those different time points. Would you explain the below chart and this? Uh, here, like we have the beats per minute. This would be like let's say uh, eighty. And then here we have hundred. Here we have hundred and twenty. And this is like a person, and then we have simply dot plots. But here we see that we don't really see the temporal relationship that easily, right? Um, so like we would have to figure something out um, for the temporal relationship. One other option would be something like a heat map, or where we kind of work, uh, yeah, where we simply show a table and then shade the cells according to the value, right? That's very scalable for this kind of data. For this size of table, it's probably not a good approach. But if I have hundreds of values, maybe that's a good uh, approach. OK, and, and for the other table? Something like here we have age, here we have 100 meters, here we have jump, and then no. here we have sex. No. No. That's true. Well, think about it the other way, right? <laughs> okay, and what do I do then? And the markers on each one would represent the each person. Like AB would be one marker, base would be one more marker than that. Okay. okay. So, and then we would color code those people. Color code, or you can use symbols, whatever. Then, what do we do with sex here? So the color of the uh, person would be the sex. Like, let's okay, say but I have sex is like here is let's say female and here's male, and now I have two males. They're right on top of each other, right? So we can do like a encircling it. Let's say it's a two symbols. Yeah, so we can like add a symbol here. So let's say it's a AB is a red triangle and basal is a red uh, Circle, so you can do like a superimposing. So you know there are two people in there. So both are red, so both are females, and both are two different people. But here this is like sex, right? No. No? Okay. Can yeah. I show it? Yeah, generally, like, let's, let's just move on, but I get, I get the idea. Uh, but I kind of like, like this, this design because we could also uh, highlight individual people like this by simply drawing a line here. Yeah? So that's a technique that we'll be talking about. It's called parallel coordinates. It's kind of a line chart, but here each of these axes has a different dimension, or has a different coordinate system. Um, so that's, that's an interesting approach. Has somebody else thought of a different uh, design? You can use a bubble chart, 
with uh, plus 100 meters and uh, faster uh, quarters jump on axis, and then age is a size interval, and sex is a color. Okay, so basically what you're saying is a scatter plot. We have, um, let's say, 100 meters. And then here we have uh, the jump. <coughs> The size of the bubble is age. The size of the bubble is age. Let's. <coughs> so, what is this good for? What can we see here easily? Like if older people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't. I didn't plot the data correctly. But uh, <laughs> my point here is we can very we can very well see the correlation between two of those dimensions, right? Uh, we can see whether there's like a linear trend or a non-linear trend or whether there's any outliers. But what if I want to, like, now we have three variables here, like age is the size of the bubbles, but what if I also want to encode sex? Oh, that's the color. That's the color, okay. What if I have six others? That's... <laughs> Eventually we run out of visual variables. And so what we can do is we can create a matrix of these plots, right? Uh, and that's what's called a scatter plot matrix. And so we'll be talking about that later. Any other ideas? We can do one more like uh, group uh, bar chart where each group is one person. Yes. And uh, the color of the person would be the sex, and the each group has different bars representing each of the columns. Yes. So eight, and then you can use different markers. And we can group it either by person or we can group it by the dimension. So right, we could have an age group, uh, or we could have a, 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 a um, uh, best hundred meter time group, um, and so on. So there's like uh, there's a lot of options in this partitioning and in the way we partition those. Any other ideas? One other thing we can do is we can simply encode the data directly in those cells, right? We can color code the cells by the value you have or have a bar chart and so on. So these are the kinds of, like, we, you covered a lot of the options that we actually have in visualizing tableau data. So let's look at this a little bit more formally. Um, so this is the, the classification uh, from the book. So the first one here is express values, where it's really, we don't uh, use a key. Um, in, the, in the second one, we um, separate order and align regions. Um, and so we'll be talking about those. And then another design choice that we have to make is an axis orientation, if we use axis, and then layout density. So this is a little bit abstract. So let's go into a couple of uh, concrete examples. But again, like, um, many of those choices that I'll be talking about, again, go back to these visual variables, to these marks and channels, um, and we will be using like, primarily uh, the, the uh, position on a common scale uh, and spatial region uh, as, as much as possible. We'll be using some color and color luminance and so on too. Um, so, um, there is, like, however, like we have the, the examples that we had here were super simple. Uh, we had very, very small tables, um, and like one of the big choices that you have to make, or the, the, the approaches are quite different depending on your scale of the data. Um, so you need diff different approaches for, let's say, a normal data as we had it here, or for high dimensional data. And I kind of like to think about this in in terms of how many dimensions can you sensibly visualize. Um, it's like about fifty. Uh, dimensions are tractable with just visualization. Uh, if you have about that, like if you have a thousand dimensions, you need some kind of analytical me methods to make sense of it. How many records do you have? If you have about a thousand records in your data set, then using just visualization usually is fine. If you have a lot more than ten thousand records in your data set, you will need some analytical methods, some aggregation, and so on. And we'll be talking about this next time. Um, and then the homogeneity. Like my point about this example is where we had these like beats per minute. Um, and, uh, uh, and these different heterogeneous columns was to make the point about um, depending on how homogeneous the table is, we, um, we have to use different encodings. Um, is it the same data type or is it on the same scale? So here is the example uh, or a similar example that we had before. Um, this is much easier to encode, much more efficient to encode uh, because I have a less, lot less, like I have one scale essentially, right? And all of the data points are on the one scale. Here I have a scale for every single dimension in this data set. Um, so this is kind of like the space of um, how little to how much analysis or algorithms we have to apply. So if we want to, if we don't, we don't have to do any analytics on um, visualizations like parallel coordinates or scatterplot matrices. However, we can use analytics uh, or algorithms to enhance them. 
Um, if you use pixel-based visualizations like heat maps, uh, we need to do some kind of like reordering as we always have to do for matrices, so we have to use some analytics. Um, and then sometimes it's more appropriate to really visualize the output of an algorithm instead of uh, visualizing the actual data. So here, um, these examples are um, multidimensional scaling uh, um, methods that are visualized. So here, we've taken a high dimensional vector and computed the similarity between them, uh, and we are simply visualizing this similarity instead of the, the raw data. And that, of course, always depends on your tasks, uh, on the scale of the data set, uh, on the methods that you have available, and so on. Okay, so let's take a step back. What is the very basic um, way, like expressing values if you don't use any keys? Well, the simplest way is as we had the scatter plot, right? We have a scatter plot where we can uh, plot two variables against each other. We can add additional information by the size of the bubbles and by the color. Uh, basically, this is where you should stop. You should then not start um, choosing your glyphs, like a triangle and the uh, and the square at the same time, because especially if you also vary size, there's a lot of interference here. Um, so this is like a sensible uh, design, uh, but it gets harder to visualize more than that. <coughs> uh, when you visualize uh, uh, scatter plots, it's often quite useful to also visualize regression lines. Um, and however, you also like I think I mentioned this that people are actually pretty good at um, at judging regressions visually. So there was a study. Uh, done recently, it showed that people actually are very good at spotting these trends and so you don't actually need to um, plot a regression line except if you have interesting cases uh, with outliers. And the idea between for regression lines is essentially to use uh, least squares to minimize some squares of the area. Kind of like to find uh, a line that minimizes the error if I calculate, if you sum up the square distances to that line. So that's the basic idea behind the algorithm. Um, and I just like this XKCD comic, um, like I don't trust linear regression when it's harder to guess the direction of the correlation from the scatter plot than to find new constellations in it. <laughs> so don't make any inferences about trends with like uh, very low R squared values and where you basically cannot spot uh, a, a correlation. And then the, like a word of warning, uh, you can always uh, calculate like a regression line but um, you should be aware of these problems that you have that we talked about when we talked about Anscombe's quartet. So those four data sets have exactly the same uh, linear regression, uh, they have exactly the same mean, they have exactly the same standard deviation, but they look very different. So it's just like, again, uh, a point for visualization. Okay, when we want to encode one key and one attribute, we essentially get into the bar chart, line chart space. Um, so um, here, if we have um, for example, like animals, then the average weight of these animals. We have the capybara, the cat, the wombat. I can choose the order of those arbitrarily, right? There is no particular reason of how to order those animals. Um, however, if I have the, uh, like a cat's weight over time, I can use the, these dot plots or these line plots. Uh, here, of course, the order is important because it's temporal data. Um, and if you want to encode multiple key attributes, uh, we have a couple of different choices. If you have two keys, three keys, or many keys. Um, and so here we will talk about matrices and recursive sub subdivision. Um, we will start with recursive subdivision. It sounds more complicated than it is. What is recursive subdivision is something like here um, in this bar chart. We have, um, we use the keys class to partition it. Um, uh, so the class is spatial, first class, second, oh, by the way, this is a Titanic data set. Um, all the people who were on the Titanic, which class they were in, uh, what their sex was, whether they died or survived. Um, and, and so like, we'll be using this data set a couple of times today, so it makes sense to think about it. Um, and what you can see here is uh, we have, like first, uh, we have the keys class. So we have essentially decided to divide this data set up by class. Um, and then we have another key, like a, a layered key, uh, where we have died or survived. And that's then kind of like a stacked bar chart here. And you can see that um, the majority of the people survived in the, in the first class. Here, like a larger, chunk, uh, a larger chunk survived in the second class, and many people died in the third class. And then we always have the choice, do we do absolute counts or do we do proportional values? 
So on the right we have proportional values, and here you see this trend even more strongly, that uh, the majority of people in first class uh, survived, whereas the majority of people in third class died. Uh, of course, here we can't see absolute values, so it doesn't uh, help us to judge how, how much, how many people died in total, or how many people were uh, on the Titanic in total. Um, this is a nice figure that compares these different options for bar charts. Um, we have like these stack bar charts here, then we have layer bar charts, um, where we essentially um, layer by category, uh, or group bar charts where we group by the items. And this is the example that we had just earlier, where we could either group by the person, or we could group by the fastest runtime, the furthest jump, and by the sex. And so these are the different choices that you have, and that's of course very related to um, the partitioning um, from the previous lecture on views. Um, another uh, hierarchic subdivision approach is stack area charts, like this one. Um, and then we can also have a proportional stack area chart. Like here, it's instead of absolute values as we have here, we have the, like the shares. We see the shares between those three different um, areas very nicely. Of course, here we can get a sense of the overall um, trends, but here we can get a sense of the relative trends uh, better. And like here is a, a, an example kind of just to highlight one of the problems. Let's assume we have uh, three different products, like the orange one, the green one, and the blue one. What are the trends that you can see here? This is over time. What's going on with the blue one? Increases. That's easy, right? What's going on with the orange one? Decreases. Decreases. And what's going on with the green one? So it's the same. Roughly correct, but in fact, it, the orange, one, the green one is is rising. Uh, like if we do instead of this uh, proportional chart, we plot a line chart. Uh, we can see that the green is in fact slowly increasing, and that this is like one of the problems that we have with stack area charts. Uh, that uh, they, it's hard to perceive what is really going on with surfaces that are within the chart. So the ones that are directly down here are easy to perceive, but the green one is hard to perceive because it also depends a lot on the uh, blue and the green one. And like one of the problems, the perceptual problem that we talked about before is that we actually don't judge the distance from here to here but we mentally charge the distance from here to here. Uh, and that's why it looks smaller than it actually is. Um, yeah, here's just a couple of other examples. This is um, gun sales um, in light orange mis mis miscellaneous, then in gray revolvers, in light blue shotguns, in orange pistols, and in blue rifles. And so anybody can spot any trends? We can see that there is a big upward tick in 2008, right? Or like starting in 2005 up to 2009 in this case here. It's probably a little bit hard to see. What do you think is like the better representation here? The stack bar chart or the stack area chart? Bar, bar chart? Yeah, you can make an argument for either. Um, but the, uh, the, the alternative would be to do like a line chart that doesn't show you the sum. So here we don't see the overall trend as nicely, but we see this nice trend of pistols overtaking guns, uh, which is hard to spot in, uh, in this other case uh, here. So this is just like uh, examples again that it depends on your data set and you usually have to experiment a little bit uh, with the representations and, and figure out what you actually want to show. Okay, so now we're going to start talking a little about the little bit more intricate and interesting visualization tabular grid matrix based representations. So the first thing is that do a very simple tabular representation, essentially take the table it's, uh, itself like a spreadsheet um, and have each variable be its own column and then use visual encodings to make it scalable. And so there's a nice historical example, the table lens, which I wanted to show you a video. For example, this is a table of the 1986 baseball statistics with 323 rows of players and 23 columns of data. We can put the data into a spreadsheet, but even using a 21-inch workstation display, the data requires nine full-screen vertical scrolls, 
and two horizontal scrolls, making it hard to work with. It's hard to find players or see interesting patterns. In short, it's hard to make sense of the information. We've devised a new way of visualizing and interacting with large tables called the table lens, which exploits graphical representations to compress the information onto the display. In this column, at bats, we integrate a familiar bar chart representation directly into the textual view of the table. Some of the rows, those in focus, show underlying textual values along with the graphical bars. Other rows, those in the context, show only graphical representations, thus requiring less space. By displaying the entire table graphically, with only some of it in focus, this 324 row by 24 column table can be shown using a portion of the screen. The table lens displays 30 to 100 times as much information as a spreadsheet in the same space. With a small set of manipulation operations, the table lens allows fluid navigation and exploration of the data. The focus area can be manipulated using control points and or keyboard commands. The number of cells in the focal area can be increased or decreased. The focal area can be moved to different rows or columns. Since the essential geometry of the table is preserved, multiple focal areas can be created. To facilitate browsing of context cell values, a mouse feedback area at the bottom of the window shows column, row, and value information. The graphical representations make it easy to spot trends and patterns and to isolate outliers or unusual cases. For example, sorting a column can reveal relationships to other columns. Here, sorting career at bats reveals correlations in several nearby columns. Notice that career hits is strongly correlated or proportional to at bats. In other words, most players have similar batting averages. Some players stick out from the curve, two well-known batting stars, Wade Boggs and Don Mattingly. To confirm these observations, we divide career hits by career at-bats, creating a new column, career average. The batting average curve is reasonably flat, as the correlation of the curves suggested, though increasingly noisy with decreasing career at-bats. Furthermore, the length of the bar shows that Boggs and Mattingly have the highest two career averages. If we focus on the salary column, we see that Boggs and Mattingly are paid relatively well for their top flight batting performances. Also note that salary is somewhat correlated with career at-bats. Team and position of a player categorize players into different groups. Category values are displayed using blips. In focus columns, the blip is colored and positioned in the cell according to underlying... Okay, so you get the basic idea. Um, this is like super useful if you can actually interact with the data, right? Um, so I, I think I showed the part of the video already when we talked about interaction, uh, but it's also important in this context here. Um, okay, and this is just an example of um, a, a, basically um, an extension of that concept. Um, let me just show you. This is a project that I've been working on recently uh, together with collaborators. And here we have an eight data set. And this is a very similar principle here. Like we can switch between an overview mode where we have something very similar to the table lens or like this detailed mode. And then here we have, I can sort, for example, by continent uh, or I can so sort by people know that they have um, AIDS. This is an HIV data set. And then here we have a, like a mix of like um, a, a matrix of um, no, new infections, new age, uh, HIV infections per 1,000 people um, in, uh, over, over time. So we have these matrix attributes, and I can also sort by these matrix attributes. And here we are simply sorting by the mean. And what is interesting about this visualization is that I can then create groups here. Now, now I have a, a, a group by continent, and then I can create aggregated representations for these groups. And now I've suddenly switched from um, a representation of, um, of every individual item to essentially representations of the continents in the same visualization. And so here we can also see um, that the, um, the matrix data and the number of people, uh, new infections is essentially like pretty high in Africa, but there's not a lot of data compared to that. Like it's pretty faint, but there's some, some data here in North America, but it's all very small compared to what is going on in Africa. And so you can use this, uh, you can also do like multi-level like grouping. So here like I'm now grouping by a human 
uh, development index, um, and so on. So just a, um, uh, a sense of, of what, what can be done just using a tabular representation. Um, this is a similar approach, but here this is more about um, kind of like creating those tables for presentation, less for exploration. Um, and this is also noteworthy for uh, like the way you can configure this, this data set. So let me show you this video. When she moves her mouse on top of any tool icon, a tooltip appears at the top of the page to recall its function. Tools are organized in groups. Clara first expands the MISC group and clicks on the H icon adjacent to the first row to mark it as a header row. She does the same for the left column. Then she expands the shapes group in order to turn numeric values into shapes. She clicks on the circle icon next to the first row of the table in order to turn its values into black circles and squares. She is satisfied, so she presses the same icon on the next row and drags down until the last row. This instantly turns all table cells into circles and squares. Now Clara wants a more compact table. Each row can be resized independently using the slider placed next to it. Moving the slider to the right increases row height, while moving it to the left decreases it. She sets all rows to their minimum size by pressing on the topmost slider, drags down until the last row, then drags left to modify all selected sliders. She does the same for columns. She also zooms in using the provided functionality of the browser. Now she wants to tidy up the table. She drags over all black arrow of icons, which immediately rearranges columns by visual similarity, which moves similar countries next to each other. She does the same for yours. Now indicators that are similar are close to each other. To better see similarities, she removes the grid by setting all white separators and black separators to their minimum value. Clara continues to format the table to exhibit more patterns and convey a clearer message. This includes inverting the values of the row, importance of a good pay, to better show its correlation with another one, the household income. She also emphasizes two rows of a specific type by changing their visual encoding, increasing their height, and dragging them aside. She encodes women's suffrage year using lines, and household income using a bar chart. She can choose to reorder only a subset of the rows, or to reorder all rows. Now she can already see country groups, we check the public in between, that she moves away. Finally, Clara adds separators, annotations, from the size groups. So this is a very nice representation of a pretty simple data set, but what I really like about this tool is how easy it makes, uh, like, creating these, these different layouts here. Um, you could also like um, have multiple line charts in a very compact representation. This is like um, an example here of what's called horizon charts. So these are little line charts where we clip the top and then add it back at the end. So like here's a good example. This line here would actually go up, okay, zoom in. Um, this line here would actually go up here, but instead of like using all this space, what they did, they clipped it and reintroduced it from the bottom. So it's called a horizon chart. Um, and we can then like use this to visualize um, a long, like a long tabular time series, um, like many different things, for example, stock prices and so on. Uh, and you could also combine various charts, um, as you've seen, like here we have an example for genetic data uh, where we have mixed different visual representations, there's some <coughs> aggregations in there, um, and then we see like here's numerical data, at the top we have categorical data, this is sorted, uh, and so on. So there's lots of choices if you want to create uh, charts like this. Uh, and now I wanted to dive a little bit into one particular uh, project, uh, which is this lineup project, which I think I have mentioned briefly. And, and lineup is kind of like an idea of how we can visualize ranking, like tabular ranking data. And I'll be using this example from a university rankings data set, uh, where we have like uh, things like Harvard and Yale, and then we have these different attributes, uh, and then try to rank uh, these universities based on these attributes. And so why do we care about rankings? Well, it turns out that rankings are popular because they help us to simplify complex content that is out there in the world, right? We don't 
we, if we want to look for a book recommendation, one way of looking for uh, good books is to look at the bestseller list. Like what other people's have, um, what other people's read might be also interesting to you. So you can look at what are the bestseller lists in certain categories, or you might want to, like, if you want to judge a university, it's really hard to understand um, what is going on. So we kind of like have a desire to like, make those things comparable, and so we calculate, uh, or we, we derive attributes, something numerical from them, and then we create these combined scoring functions. But ranking also have this problem that something as complex as a university is really hard to, uh, to judge. Like, how important is the citations per faculty for an incoming undergraduate student, right? Is not the faculty-student ratio much more important than that? So, um, if you look at just like a university ranking, uh, you don't have those choices. Some editor has made, made those choices for you uh, and will should simply show you what they believe. So let's take apart like, what does such a ranking compose. Here we have uh, a ranking of different universities and then we have like one global score. And so now we know a little bit more because we show a score. We, we don't only show like the rank, but we show also the score. And that tells us here that, for example, Harvard and MIT are rather close, but Princeton is a little bit uh, separated, which is information that we couldn't really learn from just looking at the rank. We can, of course, visu um, visually represent that score as a bar chart. But then we also want to be able to support multiple attributes in, a, in, a, in such a ranking. So instead of having one score, we want to have like um, the score express a function of a combination of attributes like A, B, and C. Um, and so how can we visually represent that? Like we can come up with a couple of these functions. Uh, for example, the, uh, the, the weighted sum, uh, or uh, a maximum, or a product, or a nesting, or any arbitrary function that you could apply, essentially how you can derive data from multiple dimensions. And in this project, we've actually developed visual representations for weighted sum and maximum values, but for brevity, um, I'll just talk about the weighted sums. So what, what do I mean by weighted sums? Like I'll take here three attributes, A, B, and C, and simply combine them as a stacked bar. And now we have this information on how, how big is the difference between the score. So I can see this difference between uh, the, the, the score between Princeton and Harvard is bigger, the difference in score between Princeton and Harvard is bigger than the score difference in uh, score between Harvard and MIT. But then I can readjust my weights. I can say like student-faculty ratio is more important to me, so I increase the the uh, the weight parameter of A, and then I can adjust the ranking. And now I also have to update the order here. And so we can see that in this case, Oxford and Princeton uh, exchange uh, places. And so here is an example of an implementation of this. This is a table of visualization for these rankings, which we call lineup. Um, and you can, first you can um, use this as a tabular representation simply, and you can sort by any of those elements. Um, but then we can create, like the interesting part is to create these combined uh, functions. So we can create like a sum combined function and then drag in these different fields. And simply sort by that, and now we have like an unweighted um, like an equally weighted um, uh, ranking of these uh, in institutions according to employer reputation, faculty student ratio, and citations per faculty. And then we can adjust, we can start adjusting the weights. So, for example, if you're a student, you might want to increase faculty student ratio, and then you can observe how that changes the ranking if I slowly increase that. Or in this case, if I slowly decrease that. Okay, um, one other thing is that very often, like, not every high value means good, right? Very often you need to kind of like have a data transformation on these scores. You can do this, of course, in the pre-processing step, but for this project we've actually developed like a, a graphical mapping, like a transfer function editor or mapping editor. So here we have like an input data set where we have a distribution of a data set that goes from minimum to maximum and map that from zero being bad to one being good. Um, and so like if we have a linear transformation, we simply have a value like this would correspond to a bar of that height up there. Um, we could also do um, an inverted transformation so that 
uh, low value is good, um, as we can see here in this example. Or uh, we also played around with like um, having a more mathematical representation of this function mapping. Uh, and then we did a little survey on like how people like this, and it turns out that nine out of the ten people we surveyed on this said they preferred this parallel version, and the one person who preferred this one was a mathematician. Um, so we we, tried, we decided to stick with the parallel representation here. Um, and so here's an example of how you can use this this mapping uh, editor. So here we have arts and humanities in this case, and I could decide, like I could filter it in some way, like here first I'm filtering, and you see the literal um, representation of the visual function um, down here in JavaScript code. Um, and I can make like uh, also these um, more complex nonlinear mappings, um, or you can use any of these. A um, little bit more like of these predefined functions. So, for example, an inversion. So here, now a low score in arts and humanities is a high value, and at this point, like Virginia Polytech does really well. Okay, and the next thing is like another task that we might want to have is to compare rankings based on different combinations. And so, what do we do here? Is we introduce like multiple of those rankings and then visualize bump charts between them. Um, and these bump charts essentially give us like a nice way of, of looking at how does a certain entity do across different combinations of rankings. Um, and so how does this look in the tool? We can simply take a snapshot here and then start changing one and then we can see the changes between the different um, instances. So we can see that here is a couple of changes um, and they're kind of easy to spot. I can also make more radical operations, like remove one of the columns in the table, um, and then we can see that Yale does really well in the first rating, but does not so well in the second rating, whereas Stanford is the other way around. So this is always exciting if I talk to university administrators, they kind of like want to find their optimal ranking for their department, uh, what is the best combination that, that makes me go show uh, up on top, but of course our intention here is not to allow people to trick the ratings, but to give people uh, a tool that they can explore those ratings by themselves. Um, and there is a JavaScript implementation of this, um, so if you're interested, you can play with it. Okay. Um, so next I wanted to talk a little bit about pixel-based displays. Here, um, each cell is a pixel value. Um, and here, as I mentioned, whenever we have these matrix um, uh, representations, the ordering is critical for the interpretation. Um, and if we don't have an inherent ordering, we usually use something like uh, clustering or matrix reordering algorithms. The big benefit of these approaches is that it's very scalable. We have one pixel per item as like the lower bound of what we can show. Uh, but it's only good for homogeneous data. So if you go back to our example with beats per minute versus these different like um, runs and, and, and long jumps and so on, um, that is of course only really suitable for beats per minute, this representation. And so here is a comparison of like a parallel coded plot, which we'll talk about more later, um, and the same data shown as a heat map. And you can see that there's kind of the same trends, but it's a little hard to spot these outliers maybe. They kind of like tend to, the, the pink outliers here tend to be more salient um, in the parallel coordinates plot than they are here, maybe. But like I guess the big trend, like that there's two clusters, is maybe a little bit more evident in the heat map. And here's a comparison of an unordered uh, heat map um, versus an ordered heat map. And so essentially, on the left, um, I see only noise, and on the right, I can see that there's actually clusters. Uh, this is also like a good example. I think I showed this before, uh, but just to show you that 3D is problematic um, if you want to represent data like this. Um, and if I were to show this representation as a heat map, you can actually see this question mark very nicely here. Couldn't I use this for heterogeneous data like we had in our second table? Um, people actually do that. So this is a, a figure from a paper, uh, from a pretty, pretty um, important and famous paper, uh, and they use actually um, the same color code for numerical data for and for categorical data, and they actually, uh, and for um, ordinal data here, 
Um, so they use the same color codes for three different data types. Um, but I would argue that this is a little bit problematic because you, like, if you have to really read this chart very closely to understand what is going on um, and to not make any false assumptions. Like here, that copy number uh, and mutation are correlated is something that you could easily um, think that is happening, but is actually not the case uh, uh, very often. And then we have talked about the problems of color mapping, of red-green color blindness. Um, here's an example um, where we can spot like a, a high outlier in a cluster if we were red, red green color blind. So instead of red green color mapping, you should always use like something like a red blue color scale. Um, this is what would a red blue color scale would look like for somebody who is red green blind. So this is safe uh, for color blind people. And then I've also shown this example before that color is relative. So if you use these matrix representations, be aware of that. So here we have those two values with the star have actually exactly the same um, data value behind them, but the one in the top is we perceive it as brighter because of its context, because of its, its surroundings. So there's a lot of things that are going on whenever we use color um, and color, but the, the, the great thing about these heat maps is that they're super scalable. So what I'm showing you here is um, a, a heat map of uh, 1,000. 500 genes by 600 people. Uh, so this is a pretty massive data set that you're seeing here. And you can spot trends, you can spot patterns. Uh, it's pretty obvious. If I did the same data set with a parallel coordinates plot, this is what I would get. Uh, and it's kind of useless um, because I simply, I can see, okay, there is some borders here, but I can't really spot much, much uh, else. Okay, so how are we doing time? Yeah, that's good. So next I want to do a design critique. Um, this is an interesting uh, visualization. This is the, uh, a yield curve um, from the New York Times. Let me go to this website. So here we have a three-dimensional yield curve. And what, is, what are the dimensions here? We see um, the years, like from 90 to 2015. Um, and then we see the uh, duration of, uh, of these um, loans or, uh, yeah, essentially how the government borrows money. Like, is it a short-term loan, a one-month one month loan, a three-month loan, or a 30-year uh, uh, loan? And you can see the different yields for uh, these different durations, um, like how much they yield um, per year um, across time. So this is a 3D uh, line area surface chart. Um, and I'd like you guys to take five minutes and look through that. And I have a couple of questions on this handout here, and then we'll talk about it in a minute. And you can also play with the online version of your computer. Yeah. 
positions of heart. channels do we have here? What are the what are the marks that we see in this chart? Line. Line. Is it a line? That's the chart. What's that? Yeah. It's kind of, well, it's a line, yes, but it's more of like a surface, right? So in this case I would say... But the surface is meaningless because the surface between a one month Curve and three month curve. What is that? So let's, let's get to the critique a little bit later. Let's just drill into marks and channels for now. Um, so, mark is like you could say at the first, like we have a line here, but mostly it's like one big mark, which is the surface. What is the channel? Position, yes. Um, and so we have the three dimensional positional attributes. We have time, we have the duration of the loan, and we have the interest rate that the government has to pay for a certain loan at a certain time. Okay, what other channels are being used here? The color codes, the yield, yes, so it's the same kind of interest rate. So we have a redundant encoding between position and color. Um, 
And so now let's talk about what is the value of the 3D here. Like you wanted to make the point that... Well, they make it a plane between each of the curves, but there's not really... I mean, there's kind of a correlation between them, but there's no meaning between the link of one month's treasury yield and a three-month treasury yield. Um, that is true. So you could say that like we have... It should just be a bunch of lines. Yes, why do you think that they didn't do that? Because it's really hard to see like a spaghetti of lines in yeah, 3D, right? Yeah. So it's easier to get a shape, like what we need in 3D. Um, you can also see that like uh, that there is some like shading here that helps us make these, these uh, 3D perceptions. What is the role of interaction here? Like why can I actually do this? Exactly, and, and I also need this to be able to really, like, by, a, by interacting with this, I get actually a depth perception. I can improve my, my perception of what is actually going on on the 3D surface. Um, if I just had a static picture, um, um, I, I, it would be much harder to judge uh, the, the three-dimensional uh, area or the three-dimensional surface. And so, what is the problem with this interaction? I can get into like funky states uh, that are not particularly meaningful, right? Um, that, that's like 3D interaction, 3D manipulation is pretty tricky. There is like um, a lot of research on how can we make uh, 3D interaction usable, and and I, it's actually hard to go back um, to a specific point. It's not terribly hard, but imagine if I also could zoom and position and so on. That would be really difficult. Uh, and so there's like special input devices like space models for people who do a CAD on drawing and so on. But what is their approach to fixing that problem a little bit? You could probably uh, keep some form of selector for each year or cluster of years so we can see the trends better because if you have the entire gamut of years, it's very difficult to visualize. If you've got a small subset, let's say two or three years, it's much, let's say, a line. Yeah. So instead of surface, it becomes like a a set of lines and then you can see the yes but like what I, what I was trying to get at is like what are their like ways out of this navigation problem that they did here they use this um, these like uh, steppers with predefined navigational uh, positions right to highlight individual elements so whenever I get lost I can simply click on one of those dots and then get back into like a safe mode uh, with context um, so, like, do you like prefer, let's say, um, here we have like a 2D representation of kind of the same data. Is this better? Or this is like good for showing, like, that we see this one line, but I think there's one other um, example. So here is a 2D curve. Uh, of the same chart, right? And we could simply, here we could plot those lines uh, for each of these, um, like um, three, one month, three months yields and so on, we could plot it separately. But uh, do you think that would be better? Like is this better than the three rep 3D representation or? Yeah, this looks cool? Well, they're illustrating the inverted yield curve, which means the short-term ones are actually returning higher than the long-term ones, which is usually a sign of recession. So yeah. what they should do is like plot the relationship between short and long-term, and then you can see when it goes below zero, that's, those are the things you're looking for. Yes, so you could do, like, to answer specific questions, you could do some, some derivation um, and, and, uh, and like, calculate the difference between short and long-term yields, for example. But my point, like I'm trying to make here, is um, this is actually like the 2D version of this chart is maybe not not necessarily superior uh, to the 3D version of this chart, right? Um, so, like, any opinions? Do you guys like this chart? Yeah. Why? Like, I've always said 3D is bad. Why do I suddenly? Like, you probably got the sense that. I kind of like this. Um, why is that? 
the three D gives more perception because there's a lot of data that's being told, which cannot be told in two D. Yeah. So we have like this. We have these relationships, even though they're not perfect, as you mentioned, um, like that we have, like we show kind of like uh, the one month and the three months and the six month and so on, uh, and with, with equal spacing, uh, we get like a good sense of the, the, the structure here. And, and the reason why this all works quite well is because the changes here are pretty continuous. So we get like a continuous surface. We don't have any super rapid changes. Um, and we have the navigation, we have the redundant encoding. Notice what is going on with the labels here. Um, the labels are always billboarded um, so that no matter how I turn it, they are readable. Uh, right? This is like a technique that you can use in 3D uh, to make sure that your labels are always readable. Uh, because if you also rotate your labels around, um, then it gets really tricky. So this is one of the examples where even though it's not completely um, uncontroversial, but it's not completely certain that you couldn't show this in any other way, um, I would argue that the 3D representation actually gives you like a good picture. But this is a very narrow case because you have a data set that, that fits very well, um, this, this problem that, has, that spans a nice surface. Um, and also what I want to highlight is this, uh, this stepper interface, right, that takes you on a tour of your data set. And so like the best class projects that I've seen in the past they do something like this, right? You, you create a visualization, but then you also highlight individual items in your, uh, in your visualization. And so this chart kind of like, um, there was a lot of discussion about this in the visualization community. Um, here is a, like, I'll share those links on Slack later. Here is a, um, a video podcast uh, discussing the creation of this chart uh, with the creator um, and two visualization experts, like a data stories, um, uh, data stories episode. Here is like a contrarian opinion of a person who thinks that this would be better done in 2D and he like redesigns it and gives a couple of examples. Um, and then this other link here uh, is um, an example of uh, and some expert who thinks it's a good, good chart but um, I saw earlier that this link is currently dead uh, but I'm sure it's not going to come live again. Um, so if you're interested, take a look at those. I'll post those on Slack. And then next time we'll wrap up tables. We still have a couple of slides on tables. Uh, and then talk about aggregation and filtering. So I'll see you on Thursday.